Good morning, Sir Michael Hill, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here at the outset, day one, round one of the Michael Hill Violin Competition. I'd like to thank especially Anne Rodder for inviting me to speak this morning about today's repertoire, but also to take the opportunity to thank the competition for involving violin students around the country by way of the masterclasses by the jury me members, which are invaluable, and we had a wonderful masterclass with Susie Park a couple of days ago. After yesterday's official welcome of the semi-finalists who've flown in from around the world, there will be a buzz of excitement growing as we approach 9.30 this morning in the hall here as the competition begins and we, the audience, settle into some intense days of listening and comparing performances. Besides having their eye on the immediate prize before them, our contestants all have in common the desire to follow their passion and to make a career in music. Earlier this year, Ara Guzalimian, Dean of the Juilliard School of Music in New York, visited tertiary institutions around New Zealand to talk about the school. I was struck by something he said, which I felt at the time was relevant to this competition and to any young musician training today. I quote, Gone are the days when students lock themselves in a practice room for hours on end, and after three years emerge to say, where is the job? How true this is in today's musical climate, where, as I'm sure my colleagues agree, absolute versatility across a multitude of genres of music is key to building a successful career as a violinist. One only has to look at where previous winners of this competition have ended up to recognize this fact. They have become concerto soloists, concert masters, recitalists, teachers, and chamber musicians, or a combination of one or more of these. What I particularly note, notice about the Michael Hill Violin Competition, and even more so this year, is the wide variety of genres of music that competitors have prepared to perform as they hope to journey through these initial semi-final rounds and on to the final. This includes unaccompanied Bach, the newly commissioned work by Kenneth Young, sonatas, chamber music, and concertos. In the first round that begins today, there are two new genres that have been added to the competition, that of the concertmaster orchestral excerpt and a work of the salon genre. I'm reminded particularly of the 2009 winner, Joseph Spacek, who became concertmaster of the Czech Philharmonic not long after his win here in New Zealand. He's a case in point of the necessity for orchestral excerpts to be mastered along with the other repertoire. The excerpt chosen for this year is the famous Danse Russe from Swan Lake, which is an extended solo of about five minutes that falls roughly into three sections. Perhaps one should keep in mind in listening to an orchestral concertmaster solo such as this is that it must be played in a way that reflects and enhances the sentiment and actions of the dancers on the stage. So I thought to give you a brief description of what would be going on on the stage as that concertmaster excerpt is performed. It opens, it's in, set in Act 3 in an opulent hall in the palace and opens with a grand introduction rather like an invitation to the dance and sounds rather like a Paganini caprice with rapid trills and double stops. A slow rising line in the solo leads into the second section. Here, the man and woman on stage begin a slow dance. They make deliberate, graceful steps with some lifts and twirls, as you can imagine. And here we hear a folk tune, played at first very simply by, by the violin, but which in places develops in virtuosity. In the last part of the dance, the pace quickens and as the male dancer shows off with leaps and jumps and spins, and you will hear the brilliant violin solo spinning almost out of control as the dance reaches a dramatic end. All of this in just four to five minutes. <laughs> Along with the concertmaster excerpt, what we will hear in this first round today are three very different kinds of music. I do not have time this morning to speak about all the works in depth, but for the purpose of, purpose of awakening and inviting your imaginations to take flight as you listen today to each competitor in turn, I beg your indulgence for a moment to equate the three genres of music 
we will hear, to a walk in the spectacular and inspiring natural setting of Queenstown. The name Bach means a stream, so as we listen first to the unaccompanied movements, let us set off on a walk. And firstly imagine being next to the stream-fed waters of Lake Wakatipu. For me, returning to a lake such as this reminds me of a lifetime of meaningful encounters with the great unaccompanied sonatas and partitas of J.S. Bach. Every violinist who studies and performs them will, at each new encounter, peer into their inky depths, sense different moods and changing colours, uncover something new, bring out something different, will ponder the ancient architecture of their depths, will walk around them and see the works from different perspectives and never grow tired of them. This is particularly true of the Chaconne from the D minor partita, the Adagio and Fugue that open sonatas numbers one and three, and the Grave and Fugue of sonata number two. Still on our walk, we will then listen to a selection of the virtuosic Paganini, Paganini caprices. Here I invite you to imagine looking up at the snow-capped remarkables. Be dazzled by their mighty awe for a moment as the, as the morning sun hits them and they are bathed in brilliant sunshine as in this morning with not a cloud in the sky to mar the spectacle. Such should be the spectacle of listening to a Paganini caprice. Thirdly, on our walk, perhaps we turn off the path for a moment and find ourselves briefly enjoying a quieter, shady nook away from the madding crowd. Or we come across a beautiful flower with enticing perfume that captivates our attention for a short time. Or we pass a street musician playing an intriguing melody or rhythm we have not heard before, and we pause to listen and are transported for a moment to another world. This is the genre of salon music, a genre I refer to as flights of fancy, because the works are generally quite brief, but are designed to capture our imaginations one way or another with their perfumes and charms. When I think of a salon, I imagine the famous painting by Julius Schmidt, which you will see on the handout, of a Viennese drawing room, showing men and women gathered in close, intimate proximity around Schubert at the piano for a Schubertiade. However, the history of the salon is much older than that and is quite a complex subject in social history, many books having been written on the subject. So what exactly is the salon genre and where does it originate? The word salon comes from salone, itself from sala, the large reception hall of an Italian mansion. Following on in history from the time when musicians and composers played and performed at the private courts of nobility, events known as salons, salons arose initially during the Baroque period in Italy and flourished in France, but over time gradually spread to be commonplace events throughout Europe, with some variety between countries as to what took place. Of noticeable difference from music taking place in courts was the mixing at salon events of different social ranks and orders, nobles and bourgeoisie, men and women, yes, women, intermingled delightfully in the French salons of the 17th and 18th centuries as social barriers were breaking down to a certain degree. The ever useful and ubiquitous Wikipedia defines the salon as a gathering of people under the roof of an inspiring host, held partly to amuse one another and partly to refine the taste and increase the knowledge of the participants through conversation. I should add to this description, hostess, because in Paris, France, it was more often than not wealthy French women who hosted the events. And in fact, the salon was very much the domain where women had a measure of power and influence, as well as the opportunity to perform and gain valuable knowledge. Music was only one of the features of a salon event. There could be dancers performing paintings hung on the wall for display and purchase, the exchange and discussion of ideas on subjects, social, literary, or even political, if so desired. When music was presented, the audience was not necessarily completely quiet for the performance. I particularly enjoyed coming across the painting by James Tissot entitled Hush, the Concert, the second one in your handout 
of 1875, which, as you can see, is of a young woman about to perform on the violin. And I particularly liked this because of the number of contestants this year that, that are women. But beyond the room, if you look through the doorway, there are various gentlemen and ladies sitting, obviously chatting on the stairs, and there's a little bit of flirtation going on in another room. So you can imagine it's not actually completely a silent performance. Salon events were very different to public concerts. Whereas at a public concert, you might hear a weighty sonata or concerto, works that demanded the full attention span and for longer from its paying audience, a typical composition suitable for the salon audience would be a light character piece. After all, its listeners had important social interactions and perhaps the odd flirtation to attend to at the same time. These pieces could contain virtuosic passages, but were not composed for virtuoso display, like the bravura concert pieces you will hear in the second round of the competition. Some were designed to be within the capabilities of an amateur player. It would be brief, charming, perhaps exotic, and intended to sway or transport the listener on a flight of fancy. Because of the power and influence and tightly sophisticated connections between those attending and hosting a salon, for the upcoming composer or performer, it was a place to make new connections. In a book titled French Music Since Berlioz, edited by Richard Langham Smith and Caroline Potter, there is reference to the famous dancer Isadora Duncan. New to Paris in 1900, her reputation rapidly flourished, due very much to well-connected society seeing her dance at salons. They write that she danced to Chopin preludes and waltzes, and at the Salon of Madeleine Le Maire in Paris at 31 Rue de Monceau, she danced to Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice. A description of Le Maire's Salon, which I will read extracts from, by the young Italian composer Alfred Casella, gives a delightful glimpse into the atmosphere of the salon. It was unbelievably heterogeneous. One met there besides the most illustrious names of aristocracy and the wealthy middle class, politicians, writers, painters like Degas and Boldini, sculptors such as Rodin, musicians like Saint-Saëns, Courteau and Ronaldo Hahn. The Le Maire home was always open on Tuesday evenings, and you could bring anybody. It was enough to be a friend of a friend. The maddest animation reigned on those evenings. There was no set program, but there was always some great artist, and every Tuesday a youth like myself was sure to learn something. Madame Le Maire received everyone with a vast smile. She was extremely ugly, but extremely likable. One received the impression that the lady of the house remained strangely extraneous to, to everything that went on in her studio. At any rate, it was a typical salon, and perhaps an historic one, as it was so completely representative of Parisian society in the early 20th century. Well, to give Madeleine Le Maire, generous supporter of the arts and artists of the day, true justice, I have included a photograph of her in her painting studio. She was, in fact, an amateur painter, and there are some very interesting portraits of flowers that, she, that are in existence that she painted. For you to see that she really was not so unattractive, and perhaps that was just the impression of a young Italian male. A couple of years ago, I was privileged to perform at the New Zealand Embassy in Paris, hosted by the Ambassadress. Invited guests and dignitaries from both the political and business world mixed and mingled with champagne and macaron. After a while, they adjourned to a spectacular drawing room lined with original artwork to listen to our accessible performance. Amongst a little Schubert Trout Quintet, we offered up a taste of New Zealand by way of a few smaller works, such as Flight of the Albatross by Larry Pruden. It was only in considering the salon genre for today's talk that I now look back and realize I had actually experienced a performance of contemporary salon pieces for a contemporary salon event. The salon genre of the 19th century is all about accessibility, charm, character, and nuance within a relatively short work. And here lies the art of performing a salon piece that we will be listening for in the competition. I would like to quote 
the great violinist and teacher Leopold Auer of the late 19th, early 20th century, and some gems of wisdom that he says about nuance in which he also parallels music with nature. Art begins where technique ends, but in interpretation, art and nature are twins. The violinist who listens to nature and develops his nuance of interpretation out of her teaching will never become a violinistic automat. For nature ever changing, ever showing us some new mood, some new phase of her inexhaustible self, is the fountainhead of variety in expression. Of course, the importance of nuance exists in performance of works of all genres, but as relating to the salon genre and lighter compositions used on the modern recital program that give relief to more serious numbers, Auer goes on to say, because of the very fact that the musical idea itself is slight, the whole musical effect of the composition lies in its interpretation. Without nuance, a nuance which gives beautiful shifting highlights of contrasted tempi and colors, many of them would scarcely attract attention. Yet light, graceful trifles of this kind are so civilized, so colored by the interpretation of the artist who plays them, that we forget their comparative musical slightness in the charm in which, with which delicacy of shading and expressive playing invest them. The salon works that competitors will play today are selected from the mid-19th and early 20th centuries when the genre particularly flourished in the Romantic period and then continued into the 20th century as short works like this entered the concert repertoire or were pulled out, as these days, as encores. Beginning with Liszt, the Romantic period was the era, era of variations on a theme that could be entertaining displays of the highest virtuosity to wow the crowd. Along with this, there was a proliferation of transcriptions and arrangements of vocal or instrumental compositions, which very often lent themselves more or less naturally to transfer to the strings. These kinds of works could be heard in the salon, but also made their way into the concert hall, and to this day are part of the soloist's variety of repertoire. Gabriel Faure, who concentrated more on instrumental music than making a reputation in the theater, was also the quintessential salon composer, and you will hear his famous Berceuse performed today. Fritz Kreisler, later on, if I might be so bold as to dub him the master of the transcription, was taking charming tunes and works by older masters and giving them a new lease of life through the idiom of the violin. One only has to read the titles of the salon works to be performed today to see that they are all about taking us on a brief flight of fancy. Tango, salut d'amour, romance. Salon works can traditionally include arrangements of folk songs, many dances with distinct features like those of the mazurka, the waltz or tango, that might point to nationalistic tendencies with both political and non-political connotations by the composer. Alternatively, a work might take on a more exotic, oriental fantasy kind of character, such as Song of India from the opera Sadko by Rimsky-Korsakov, arranged for violin by Chrysler, or Pièce en forme de Habanera by Ravel. Looking at the works in round one that the contestants will present, I thought to share a little more background information on three of these that you will hear more than once. Chopin's Nocturne in C-sharp minor, originally of course written for piano, is titled Lento con gran espressione, and sometimes called Reminiscence. It was composed in 1830, dedicated to his sister, and later transcribed for violin, as you will hear today, by Nathan Milstein. Transcriptions also exist for flute, and one for cello by Piatigorsky. Chopin himself shied away from public concerts as he was not the exhibitionist that a pianist like Liszt was. In the book, The Outline of Music, Sir Malcolm Sargent writes, he was at his best in a salon, and the introduction to the Rothschilds gave him the run of the fashionable salons of Paris where he could earn large sums of money by playing and still larger ones by teaching. 
Chopin's waltzes, nocturnes, and impromptus for piano were very suited for performance in salons. You might recall that this particular nocturne in C, sharp minor, was used as the theme for the 2002 movie The Pianist, starring Adrian Brody. Virtuoso pianist Franz Liszt was, like Paganini, a superstar in the public arena and composed more bravura style, pure virtuoso display works than salon works. However, in 1849, during a difficult period of his life, and just after Chopin had died of consumption at the age of just 39, he had come across a book of poems called Consolations, written in 1830 by Charles, Charles Augustin Sainte Beuve. And these apparently appealed to Liszt, who was writing a book about Chopin at the time. This consolation, I think it's the third consolation we'll hear today in round one, is described by one writer as having a bass accompaniment like a Venetian boat song with an out-of-sync melody on top. Again, the arrangement of this work for violin that we'll hear today is by Nathan Milstein. Heading into the 20th century, the great Austrian violinist and composer Fritz Kreisler was born in 1875 and lived until 1962. As I mentioned earlier, he's famous for both his own salon genre works as well as his transcriptions for violin and piano of works by other composers. These delightful works also endure today in the repertoire of concert violinists who might in this day and age pull them out to perform at a private event or as encores at the end of, the, of a recital. Out of all the composers listed in the salon genre of the competition today, there is most likely only one who ever visited New Zealand's fair shores. I wonder if you can guess who that might have been. I have here an original program from Fritz Kreis's first visit to New Zealand and Australia. You'll have it and you can see the cover of it in your handout. In 1925, when he was aged 50, I've copied the cover page for you to see on your handout. Chrysler, the musical soul of the world, it says. I find it interesting in that it reflects on the kind of recital programming of the day that was somewhat different to what one might hear today in a violin recital. It had a weighty, more serious first half, followed by a second half filled exclusively with salon pieces. First up, a Handel Sonata, this was followed by the, e, the Bach E major unaccompanied partita, which you will hear today. Interestingly, and not uncommonly, Chrysler had decided this called for accompaniment, and so wrote one to go along with the movements he performed. This was followed by the complete Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, performed with piano accompaniment, something one would not hear in a standard recital today. After the interval is a succession of no less than six salon works in a row, which are his own arrangements of Tartini, Rimsky, Korsakoff, and Dvorak, along with his original works, Tamaran Chinois and Caprice Biennois by Chrysler himself. He obviously had an abundance of self-confidence in his composition. The encore on that particular evening, as is handwritten by whoever owned this program, there's a little note at the, at the very end here, um, was Schön Rosmarin, which is the third in the set of pieces he composed called Old Viennese Melodies, published in 1905. The first two in this set are works you will hear today, Liebeslied Loves Sorrow and Liebesfreud Loves Joy. Rounding off the evening was, of course, God Save the King. To return to my opening theme of a walk in this spectacular New Zealand setting, I conclude with this delightful quote of Chrysler in an interview in reference to the fostering of young talent. And let him know nature, let him go to nature to learn that the most wonderful song in the world is the song of the forest. Thank you.